You never grew up? Is that what you're trying to tell me? I never grew up. Oh, what I mean by that is uh, 50, uh, 60 years ago, 50 years ago, New Orleans was considered one of the friendliest uh, cities in the nation, one of the greatest destinations for tourism. Uh, when the country changed, primarily uh, the country changed with the uh, Opeka versus uh, the Brown versus the Opeka Board of Education decision, and we started integrating. There were tremendous social changes all over in the nation. New Orleans changed as much as any as any other city. Excuse me. Uh, that's one major influence. Second influence is as the country matured and everything changed, and we became more electronically innovative, and uh, our daily actions were more electronically. The old southern states and the old southern uh, towns like New Orleans changed. Uh, when I was a kid, we could go down and with no fear walk through the city and uh, listen to music, listen to uh, people on the front porch playing guitars. It was quite a music city. And obviously with the changes in the drugs and whatever that came in, the hard drugs that came in, the mellowness of living in New Orleans uh, became radically different. And uh, that's one of the big changes I see. And now, interesting, interestingly enough, with all of the uh, changing that has occurred, we're now going back to a lot of music, a lot of friendliness. And the, the city's a wonderful place now, with the exception of the uh, infrastructure that has to be upgraded because of uh, Katrina exposing all of the problems. But uh, just a wonderful place where one can be a kid, you can run around, and in most neighborhoods, people, well, that's a key point. We have neighborhoods in New Orleans that still are neighborhoods where people know each other and it's, hello, how are you? And they're mixed, if you're thinking of the racial terms, and uh, people are just going about their merry way. Most are not willing to work very hard or very long, and they're willing to put up with uh, a lower income and they lower uh, standard of living if they could just do their own thing. Jerry, I don't know if you remember in 68, there was a trial um, for the, uh, uh, um, I guess it was the Black Panthers. Um, and uh, I, I had just graduated from college and had gone back, was in New Orleans for that one year. And I attended the trial, and it was so fascinating. This um, Yankee lawyer had just, you know, come down to New Orleans. I forget his first name. His last name is Glass. Do you know who I mean? I'm sure he's still down there. Spell his name? Glass. Like you, you glass of water? drink out of a glass of water. Oh, Bob Glass. Yeah, Bob. No Bob Glass. Yeah. yeah, so he, he had defended the Panthers. And um, so the trial was over, and it was like a bullshit case. And um, so, of course, they were found not guilty. And uh, there was a big party afterwards, and, you know, the um, attorney general and the DA and the jury and the Panthers and everybody was just partying together. <laughs> I don't remember that, but I don't doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know Bob Glass personally. He, uh, he's a casual friend of mine. Yeah. Uh, just uh, That's part of New Orleans. I mean, what can I say? Uh, it's not unusual in parish prison for the... Uh, inmates to have musical instruments just go about and play it. It's uh, the city that care for God. So I don't know. I don't remember the trial, but I, I know Bob Glass has done. I also know some cases where some uh, former felons went up to Baton Rouge to play heavy card games with the governor. Yeah. That's uh, that's an interesting point. They go into the governor's mansion to play cards. <laughs> legal as long as the house does not take a percentage of it. <laughs> that does take one time to reflect. So, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, but going back, if you want to go back to the marijuana bit, uh, I just left a meeting, and everyone there said he or she was going to vote for me. Oh, wow. I doubt, I doubt if that's going to happen. <laughs> but, uh, people have accepted this. It's like People are coming out of the closet now. Well, saying, sure, why not? The, the thing that I find interesting is that, you know, nationally, not just in New Orleans, but all over the country, people are saying, I mean, they're kind of 
you know, way out people, but nevertheless, people are saying legalize marijuana, it will solve the nas not just the local budget problems, but the national budget problems. Oh. One, of Jane, one of Jane's classmates who uh, happens to be my brother was telling me that in reflection, as a reflection to my policy, he said that it'll help the national defense. I said, Myron, what are you talking about? He said, well, as soon as you're buying drugs, like he didn't say marijuana and or whatever, as soon as you're buying drugs, you're supporting al-Qaeda. He said, if we quit buying drugs over there and grow them here, we have the geography and the terrain to do it. If we, if we wouldn't miss the millions of billions or whatever it is going over to support al-Qaeda. Just grow them here. It's helping our national defense. If people are doing it, just do, just do it and tax it. So... I completely agree. I mean, I think it's ridiculous that everybody's making such a big hoo-ha about it and the fact that they're not taking you seriously. And now it seems like they, the tide has shifted. It is shifting, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to win this election, but I'm curious as to how many votes I will receive. I'm really hoping there are 11 candidates running. Uh, I'm one of the five who is, who is specified as non-candidates, so to say. Minor candidates, no chance, but, but et cetera, what? et cetera, gadflies. And but I'm what? wondering if I really could come in as high as five or six. But but why are they considering you as a non-candidate? I raised $2,500 of my own money while everyone else spent a quarter million, half a million. One person spent over two million. So I did not buy television advertising. I did everything by the computer, word of mouth, and handouts. Jerry, what what uh, actually inspired you to get interested in this issue? Sibling rivalry. <laughs> <laughs> I feel. Well, is, is Myron is Myron running? My brother Myron could do to, uh, is, is he running for governor? <laughs> when I ran for U.S., I didn't run for U.S. Congress. Last year, we had a uh, horrible, horrible individual, Bill Jefferson who was uh, convicted of 16, 15, whatever, counts of uh, improper action, improper behavior in the government. Uh, he had been in, I don't know if you remember Bill Jefferson, Jane, but... No, no. What, what position was he? U.S. Congress. Uh-huh. Representing New Orleans, and uh, he was under indictment of blah, blah, blah. Two, three, four of members of his immediate family, whatever number, were... Uh, Convicted or they're currently under indictment or they pled no, not guilty or whatever. And uh, the key point is he was finally convicted and now on appeal he's still out of jail. But I think it was literally 16 or 18 uh, counts of felonious action. Anyway, uh, the whole point is that it looked like he was going to win the re-election. And I said, this is ridiculous. So I put my name in the ring as an independent meaning I would not have to go through a primary, and uh, I would see him, meet him face on in the, ele in the general election. The Republicans at that time did not put anyone up of any significance. So I, I was going to give the people a last chance scam, a last stop of Jefferson. After I did that, the Republicans finally put up someone. Brian Wagner was his mentor, Jane, if you remember Brian. And uh, I pulled out on Gal, the Vietnamese, Joseph Chow, is his trade name, his name is An Gao, he won by less than 2,000 votes. If I had stayed in, mm -hmm. I would have taken more than 2,000 votes away, and it would have split the election and put An Gao out on the streets and Bill Jefferson back in the And that's exactly why I pulled out. And uh, the end result was that uh, everyone thanked me for doing it, and I'm very happy I did not win U.S. Congress. But now I'm running for mayor for a, polit a political statement, not really wanting to win. Well, like I said, what ticket are you running on? Is it an independent again? In Louisiana, we do not have independents, and the reason is that you have so many independent parties, Louisiana Independent, American Independent, Central Louisiana, Southern Independent, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so in Louisiana, I am an independent, yes, but in Louisiana, technically, it's called no party. And the reason it's called no party, uh, as opposed to independent, is to uh, prevent the uh, 
various independent parties expressing uh, criticism. So the the history of uh, of Louisiana having um, checkered politicians <laughs> is is long. <laughs> um, you know, going way back, but I, I do remember in my lifetime when, um, I, I forget who was um, running for governor. It might have been McKithen, but it, the other, the opposing side was David Duke. Duke who's, John, no, no, Edwin Edwards. Yeah, Edwin, that's right, Edwards. So David Duke, of course, is a flaming racist, like KKK racist. Yes. So all of the, uh, the, the liberals and the non-racists in New Orleans were carting around bumper stickers on their cars saying, vote for the crook. Because <laughs> 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 was, Edwards was indicted, wasn't he, for a bunch of stuff? He's currently in Hopeville Correctional Facility. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wait, what for? <laughs> uh, Former governor of Louisiana, you have to understand. He not only ran, he had been governor. He was the incumbent. He was governor three times. <laughs> and he he's, wait. He's in prison for racketeering in government. What exactly does uh, that mean? What's, what's interesting is the uh, the only way in federal prison one can have a sentence commuted or pardoned or whatever is by the uh, United States president. For good behavior, he must serve eighty-seven and a half percent of the prison term. If he wants to get out on good behavior. He still has to serve 87 and a half percent of the prison term. So how many years does he have left? I think it's perhaps five, four or five or so. Uh -huh. And uh, if you remember the name Carlos Marcello. Yeah, of course. Uh, allegedly the head of the Dixie Mafia. Yeah. Uh, Carlos yeah. was let out of prison before then because uh, it was a very unusual situation. The... Uh, the prison medical unit did not have the facilities to treat him. It totally lost his mind to uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, or whatever. And uh, quite often a prisoner is let out early for medical reasons that cannot be satisfied in prison, such as dialysis or dementia or whatever. So uh, but <coughs> by then the person is, by no one's imagination, a threat to society. Uh, well, speaking of New Orleans having neighborhoods, Carlos Marcello actually was my neighbor. <laughs> Your neighborhood? Yeah, he lived he lived uh, down the block from us. And what was he like? North? Yeah. I, I did not know that. Yeah. Oh. What was he like as a neighbor? No, I never knew him. Okay. They weren't like shootouts in the neighborhood? <laughs> no, no. I knew the man. It's even better. Your cousin Kenny knew the man. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Ellis tell you that if you knew Ellis. Yeah. Ellis knew the man. What happened is, at one time, briefly, we were all considering putting in a huge office on the first floor of a building in Metairie that had insurance, law, CPAs, et cetera, et cetera. Carlos came through to see Ellis for whatever reason. He turned to Kenny. He said, what's your name? He said, Kenny Paylet. said, oh. You know, you think it's his grandson and Gerson as your uncle? You like that one? <laughs> uh, well, I guess... Uh, I don't get the joke, but... Well, I think the, the joke is that the Jews and the Mafia all knew each other. <laughs> well, all in it together. <laughs> they were all in it together. Yeah. That's what happened for real. So, so, so what kind of impact do you think that your campaign is going to have? I think it's going to have a serious impact. The uh, district attorney will not give me any credit, but he announced at a uh, state of the his annual address in the city uh, it was a week ago Tuesday night that uh, they were looking into a number of things, one of which was trying to change many crimes and consider them committing petty crimes and tried to have them redirected to the municipal court system. And uh, that way it would relieve the burden on the uh, criminal judges, the prisons, etc. Yesterday I had a meeting with uh, the chief of the, the executive director 
of the uh, indigent defenders, public assistance in New Orleans. And he mentioned that also. And he, I said, well, do you think it's a reflection of my candidacy? He said, I don't know. He said that he's been thinking about this and stating it for about a year. For whatever reason, he decided to announce it now. So whether that's a reflection of mine, I don't know. But uh, I'm not really looking to take credit. I'm just looking to help, help the city. Today, just to put it in the point, what is not the typical, but what is not an uncommon situation, it's 52 degrees and raining, the numerous homeless in New Orleans. I was at a McDonald's to pick up a veggie burger, and I went to the men's bathroom, and there was an indigent there, perhaps 60, 65 years old, soaking wet. Uh, I'll just say he reeked. He reeked. And uh, he was standing there hiding out from the rain. So where do the homeless people exist in New Orleans? Are they living on the street? Are there um, shelters? The street underneath the home uh, overpasses. Uh-huh. At one time, they had tents there. And are there more homeless people since Katrina? Uh, I don't know statistically, but I, I think there were. I think there are. So, uh, but, but Jerry, you, you, uh, it sounds like you kind of are um, up on New Orleans politics and New Orleans government, so you probably have some thoughts other than marijuana about how the city could be improved? Well, I think you have to start. You know, the little acorn doesn't fall far from the big oak tree. And I think the little acorn has to be planted and start to grow big. My personal agenda, uh, which is thoughts, I have no authority to do anything. My personal agenda is to decriminalize marijuana, and this will free up half the police force. This has been stated by the police from the DA, etc., and uh, send the marijuana offenders as opposed to felons. I'm not talking about trafficking, I'm talking about personal use of medical marijuana, etc. Send them into the municipal court system, and they'll be given a fine like a traffic ticket, and then they go their merry ways. And then the criminal court system is unclogged. But then that, that doesn't decriminalize it. That only uh, lessens it as a criminal. So taking away from a felony. Yeah, well, but, yeah, I thought, I thought you were supporting actual legalization of it. Well, I didn't say decriminalization. Oh. So I'd be happy with legalization. Uh-huh. Okay, the you're... Of, the more I think about it, I, I wouldn't care if opium and cocaine, heroin, and whatever else is made legal. That way you go into the grocery store and you buy a carton for whatever. Yeah, well, as yeah. As opposed to putting, I don't even know, $500 into the hands of the folks. Well, I have no objection to legalization, but it's just not going to fly initially. Yeah. You have to start somewhere. But uh, then the whole circle starts to begin. That if the criminal court system is unclogged and the police are unclogged, it means the uh, police will wear bigger fish. And if the bigger fish are unclogged, people can safely, uh, without fear of felonious arrest, people can uh, come into the city and do a joint. The hotels are going to get more people, and the restaurants are going to get more people, and the unemployed will have an opportunity to uh, have some employment, and then the service industries will grow, the food brokers will grow, and the dry cleaners will grow, and everything grows, et cetera, et cetera. And Jane, we would even have fix potholes. And uh, <laughs> this would also bring in a tremendous amount of talent. When the economy is growing, talent will come in and we can bring in research uh, facilities. We can bring in high paid jobs, whether it's a PhD or a construction manager for the housing that's needed, or et cetera, et cetera. In addition to this, within two or three years, the new medical center is going to have construction begin. They're tremendous and very uh, abrasive of comments going around about the debates. Our main hospital, Charity Hospital of Louisiana, which for years was considered one of the major hospitals in the nation for people to train in trauma, trauma units, uh, that was destroyed by Katrina. 
and the two agendas on the table. One is let the state take over the whole thing, tear down Charity Hospital, which I think is 30 or 40 floors. It's totally vacant right now. Just tear it down, bomb it out, and rebuild a uh, $10 billion project. So a $10 million project for the new uh, hospital, veterans administration, building, et cetera, et cetera. And the other is to repair Charity Hospital. Well, it doesn't matter which one is going to be done. I'm not qualified to say which one is better, uh, but I can say that that's going to hire at least 5,000 people over 10 years to do it. And the governor is <coughs> over 15,000 people. I hope he's right and I'm wrong. That would give a tremendous economic stir. And again, we would be in a uh, after-war economy where you're rebuilding a significant part of the city. And it's just going to bring millions and millions and millions into the city. And, uh, that would help the economy. <coughs> I think the leaders are concentrating on the wrong things. They're saying the same things that have been said since we were kids. And if you uh, repeat the same behavior, you can get the same results. For, for us that didn't grow up in New Orleans, what did they say when you were growing up and what are they still saying? About what? Well, you were saying that, they, that in politics, they're just saying the same old thing, which is what? Well, yeah, yeah, we're going to improve the schools, we're going to fix the roads, <coughs> we're going to find the money to do this and find the money to do that, blah, blah, blah. There's and, a and new newspaper coming out in New Orleans on Saturday. I was interviewed for two hours a couple of weeks ago. It's called The Lens. It's going to be a weekly handout, not throwaway. Uh, it's going to have a feature article on me. I have not seen it, but I was told. Among other things, it's going to say that I was the only candidate who gave answers to questions. We're going to find a way to fix the New Orleans Recreation Department. We need to get the money, and I'll help get the money. The billions of dollars that the federal government has earmarked to us from Katrina, and no one has gotten the money yet. We're going to figure out a way to do it. I will help do it, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, no one said how. So, ba so basically, you're saying that none of the money ever got to New Orleans? A large portion did not. A large portion was held back by a combination of uh, mistakes by the governor, the U.S. senators, and the mayor of New Orleans. The icing on the cake, and you can throw the U.S. government in stronger. The icing on the cake was, I forget the time period, but there were floods, the rivers overflowing in Iowa, and people were, do you remember that, a year or so ago? Definitely. Um, okay. So what's it at like? Time, at that time, U.S. Mary, U.S. Senator Mary Landrieu announced that she uncovered some information. I don't know if she had it before. That there was eighty-three million dollars of dry goods stored for relief of Katrina victims: t-shirts, diapers, bottles of water, pots, pans, dishes, dry food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Eighty-three million dollars was stored wherever in warehouses. She tried to get it to be sent to New Orleans because we still needed it. And the response from FEMA was that the time period is over. We can't send it to New Orleans. And then she said, okay, well, then let's give it to Iowa and help them and then we'll get ours later. We can't do it because it was directed to New Orleans. Gosh, you can't send it to us because the time period has expired. And you can't send it to Iowa, to Des Moines, Iowa, I think it was, because it's directed to New Orleans. Well, then how can we send all this money to the tsunami? And how can we now send money to Haiti, et cetera, et cetera? It, it's, it, nothing's working. It, it's mind-boggling. So how do you survive in New Orleans these days? Well, uh, I'm having a good time. <laughs> I was, one of, the, I was one, of the, one of the few who built a proper business and, uh, you know, while I did lose money in various investments over the years, I came out ahead on the top. So I'm surviving. Well, that's good to hear. We, we have about less than a minute left, and I don't know, is there anything that you and Jane want to discuss after all these years that hasn't been? <laughs> do I? Do you have to remember for the benefits <clears throat> of New Orleans, the flooding of Katrina did one great benefit. It increased the crawfish crop. <laughs> Well, I mean, Jane? go ahead. Jane, anything? Uh, 
um, let the good times roll. <laughs> it's a little bone TPA. It's a bone TPA, yeah? A share. A share. You know, that, that's one thing that I really miss, the uh, Cajun population in southwest Louisiana, the native French speakers, they're rapidly vanishing. Yeah. It's one of the rich cultural traditions of South Louisiana. Yeah. So... But I guess we call that progress, and I call it social change. I call it a shame. Yeah, that's true. Um, parenthetically, I heard that after Katrina, the highest um, subgroup population of suicides was doctors. Yes. Uh, my cardiologist told me, and again, I lose track of time, but this was uh, within the uh, 16, 18 months after Katrina. He personally knew 11 physicians who committed suicide. Yeah. How do you, how do you understand that, Jerry? Uh, Post-traumatic stress syndrome. Heavy. That's an overemphasis that uh, cardiologists told me uh, I was having serious problems, and I'm still having serious problems. Every day I uh, drive along and I see what used to be a happy memory for me of whatever happened then, and, you know, one uh, place that I thought uh, that I had a happy memory was literally the building was upside down. No. Uh, so uh, quite a few people have gone on uh, various anxiety, anti-depression drugs, and, et cetera. And uh, my cardiologist told me that 50% of his patients aren't symbolic, and the mm. other 50% should be. Um, I had decided that I was not returning to New Orleans, that I wouldn't be able to bear seeing what it would look like. And I did abide by that for uh, several years. And then my uncle died, and he was a well-known figure in New Orleans, a psychoanalyst like I am. And they had a memorial service for him at the Museum of Art. And I felt I had to go. And so I went down and kind of broke the ice. And now I, I come down, you know, frequently. But it was uh, it was a difficult decision to to make to to go back. Well, I live not too far from the museum of art. Yeah. No, I, re I remember where you live. Okay. Bleeka used to tell me where you lived. <laughs> Bleeka. Oh, Bleeka. Oh, Bleeka. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Bleeka. Good old Bleeka. But uh, I'm just saying. Now, that's another memory of New Orleans. Uh, do you know why her name was Bleeka? Um. The residents and interns worked at Charity Hospital and had the OBGYN staff, of primarily their uh, uh, OB staff, uh, the OB work, I should say. They were up 36, 48 straight hours doing nothing but uh, delivering babies to indigents, okay? And some of the names they gave were rather cruel, such as you had twins, and they were called Mally and Femali. You had... Uh, you had uh, a baby born at an oblique ankle, ankle delivery, so she became oblique. And, uh, they were picking on the innocence and the uh, ignorance of people who were taken to Charity Hospital for deliveries. And that, that was another institution in the world. All of this was overturned by the Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education. And then suddenly we had a lot of civil strife. We had a lot of... Uh, fighting, both verbal and physical, because uh, of this change. <clears throat> What's happening right now today in New Orleans, the election is in two days for, for the mayoral and council seats and other municipal elections. And what's fascinating is right now, if the election had been held yesterday, Mitch Landrieu, who's heir to one of the big political uh, families in New Orleans, whose sister is U.S. Senator Mary Landrieu, Mitch is in the front row. I've had many conversations, because I'm running for mayor as a candidate, with many of the African Americans, the Creoles, the blacks, whatever term you want to use. They're very upset because it looks like the whites are going to get the power back. And they say it's not because they're racist, but it's because they have the power and want to continue it. I don't know how to interpret that, but they tell me they're not racist. Uh, you know, the whites are probably going to get the mayor position back with it. Right now, we have a city council that is uh, majority white. None of this has happened since 19, whatever, 56, 58, or whatever. Uh, 
Uh, I'm, I'm presuming that Nagrin is not running, is that correct? Nagrin has, he's not able to run this two-term limit. Uh-huh. The Wallace. And that must be a blessing, yes? To the city? Yeah. Yeah. And what I found out recently is that uh, he supposedly was uh, the president and had all the authority to run a big cable TV system. But what I found out recently, he was put in there to satisfy a requirement of November. 